Okay. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank. Lou, Mr. Lou. Lou, that is an amazing name. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm a Sublime fan, so like Lou Dog or, you know, Lou. It hits really deep. You know, my parents weren't really original. They just went with Robbie, and then they had to name it right after the last name, too. And I'm like, nice. But but it is a musical name, though. I'm sure you're. Everyone says that. He owns my Twitter. I can't have a personal handle because that man is just, oh, he's, man. he retweets his own stuff over and over. I'm like, are you lonely, sir? He probably is since I don't think he's made a record in <laughs> like my age here. <laughs> because, yeah, he hasn't made a lot of music before. Not, not a long time. Um, but Lou, man, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? All right. Well, uh, I teach history at the State University of New York at New Paltz, which is about 75 miles north of New York City. And I've been there for almost 30 years now. And I teach uh, his courses on early American history and 17th century England. And I'm teaching a course this semester on the so-called age of discovery. I'm interested in empire and cultural interactions in the period from like 1400 to 1800 do you, like, the do you like the experience of the growth or do you like more of the concept of like just the interaction when it comes to like just seeing how like maybe cultural exchanges happen how like we start to see like mm -hmm. trades of like silk landing in places where there shouldn't be silk but it, you start to realize it's <laughs> all from trade efforts that start to happen but like how did this get here i'm like i don't know why do we have dominoes in like there's dominoes in brazil i don't know how it got there but it just expanded and got there i think that's fascinating yeah kind of, i mean i mean i guess it's kind of counterintuitive but but these kinds of uh this is what i'm trying to think of this, these kinds of uh, oddities are, really interest me. I mean, this, this idiosyncr idiosyncratic stuff, exactly like dominoes in Brazil. How does how does this happen? People like pizza. <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, and of course, but of course, they're also you get really grim stuff too because the history of enslaved Africans and the trafficking in, in these people is a part of it. It's an integral part of this and. Yeah. It gets to be pretty, pretty grim, as I say, and and that has to be addressed as well. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard because whenever like early American history, my first thought when you said that was to start talking about like because it's hard if you talk to an anthropologist or you talk to someone who studies indigenous studies they have two separate views on everything anthropology is more like you cannot think in the time period of how we do now for back then you cannot compare those two because the evolution of thought but indigenous studies is like at least from the people i've talked to with it i bet there's a lot of good people in that craft but they're really about like you don't know anything about this and it's like you're so involved into this you've seen so much bloodshed where you need the truth like when people found out that George Washington's sleep teeth weren't made of cherry wood, they were made of slave teeth. Everyone lost their goddamn mind. I'm like, hang on a second. Like, this is a different time period. You know, you have to think back then about what people knew back then. At one point, we thought that everything revolved around the earth, and we don't think that anymore. You cannot mm -hmm. use your knowledge you have now to preface it that before. So, I mean, is there any, like, information or is there anything that you've, like, kind of found interesting that can actually might help out in a situation where people look at their country as this burn it all down scenario i'm like let's not do that i actually you know i i just bought a garden <laughs> well well the, the 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 big the big problem with all this is that there's always this tendency to speaking of what you know to to focus on the american aspects of things when in a lot a lot of a lot of the stuff involved it's the legacy of activities by Americans, people living in America and Europe and Africa. And people didn't just arrive in America and just get going with themselves. It's, it's all part of this larger set of interactions. And, and I mean, I read a bunch of ledgers and accounts of what contemporaries call the Guinea trade. And human beings are, are part of the, they're like shopping lists. Like, you, you, like your mother, your mother sends you to the grocery store for butter, and there are letters from the directors and or the managers of these companies or whoever is running these voyages to the merchants and the and the ship captains who are down there. Go here and get X number of and and they're very rarely called 
slaves in the 17th century. It's, it's all, almost always Negroes. Get so many, get so many here. If you can't get them here, if you can't get it at the store here, then go to the other store and you get that many. And 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 also be sure to pick up ivory or elephant's teeth, as the documents call them, and maybe some pepper and some other stuff. I mean, the mind <laughs> boggles. <laughs> what the <laughs> You start to like, I, I know, because um, especially when you're like, I've talked to an Egyptologist who studies like transcripts and stuff like that. It's important stuff to ledger down information so you can be able to record it to be able to know the factual stuff. Of it. But man, you get lost in it all. If you really try and examine, like there's so much history where like I've tried to stay relevant with like near times or maybe like the past 100 or 50 years because I like the ancient stuff. I really do. But it's just man it's when you go so far back there's just so many pieces where like where where's this well they haven't found that and it's like ah can i what about jfk oh we haven't found that either so that's a bad example i'm like jesus like i can so i just want to know what's happening because i think like i've talked about before is that there's a major identity crisis in a lot of people and i think this comes from a place of not knowing who or what or where to go and i think this is not new this has always been around there's always been that thing and i think um i mean the age of life for instance 20 late in your late 20s there are people that were discovering america and that were you know doing these amazing things now people in their late 20s they build a birdhouse and they think that like their life is like somehow insufficient because they're not capturing a country or something i'm like well our age of life has expanded so it's actually you're trying to compare to something where their lifespan might have been 50 45 if they're like good and lucky but now we're in our hundreds and our 90s so there's an important understanding of who you are that you're not that far off from the target and i think that's what history can teach us a little bit too is that our evolution of thought has progressed our ability to understand has uh, evolved not looking at it like all these horrible acts but looking at it like that's amazing how we don't think like that anymore yeah i mean the idea of progress and modernity kind of related that, that's something that i i think about all the time and and yes I mean, it's not even the case of in the case of the of going to Africa and, and doing these kinds of things. It's not even they didn't even think about it. They 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 turned up. They went to the store, so to speak. I mean, and then, <laughs> and, and and then and then in English case, they had it all mapped out. They they hit the, the current across, went to Barbados, and and then chance these people. I mean. It's, it's, it's just just to give you an example, I was the last time I was in England, I found this this case where the thing, these, these, these English characters had worked out this kind of global trade, and then these the Dutch, I don't know, they're not really enemies, but they're competitors. One of them sent a ship to what is it, Gabon, on the on the west coast of Africa, and their job they were told you sit here and attack English ships going by, and the merchant in charge said, you, you, you should, I want you to collect up to 2,500 people and ship them, you know, the Cartagena in, what is the Colombia, which is the center of the Spanish page, uh, slave trade, and then we can resell them there. So this, this, these people weren't even, yeah, they, were, <laughs> they weren't even trading, they were pirates and picking, picking them off as they went by. And so there was a, there was a case they were they, the the crew were captured and and these guys knew each other too, which is even more bizarre. The people that attacked them knew knew the, the yeah. crew that were <laughs> that they marooned. <laughs> They're talking about this like, what are you doing? So they put them on. They, they marooned them and gave them one, and then they gave them one ship and then took off. And there were about two hundred and fifty people below decks that no one talked about, which is the kind of thing that really is the crux of this. Back to your point, where. No one said anything about the people who were below decks. They were they who knows what happened to them. They were shipped, they would they were taken on board the, the other ship and taken off to Spain, and no one said a second thing. And who and they must have been completely I mean, at least they wondered what's going on here. And B that, that has yeah. me thinking so much right now, where I'm like, damn, it's like <laughs> it's like imagine you living in your house and there's just someone that's in your kitchen, and you're like, I'm not even gonna acknowledge that person's there. Like, that's just like, 
Yeah. This is where, like with history, for instance, like um, the Somalian pirates, they used to be known as like the volunteer firefighters of Somalia, which they've just eventually people like the government came down there and completely like started o like opening up these like giant fishing markets and really capturing all the fish that was in these oceans where these people had to start robbing ships and destroying them just so they can be able to get food for themselves, where they became this liberation style police. And it's like you start yeah. to see like people see the ending image and not the whole build up to the whole thing. And I think that's a crucial detail in a lot of this stuff because history is so expansive where you hear notes about things and an article gets retweeted or published but i'm like but what's the whole picture here we're getting pieces i want to see everything that led up to this you start to realize like i don't think those people are just burning down military ships because they're enemies no they're burning it down because we've done something or they're somehow we've affected them in a way to cause a retaliation i mean that's the whole thing like uh whenever thanksgiving gets brought up everyone always talks about oh my god thanksgiving do you, do you even know what that means you're celebrating the massacre i'm like well actually it was to celebrate 50 years of peace like it was supposed to be this thing where not a lot of people like you're supposed to break bread with these people br break bread with these people that you've never encountered before that you've been fighting with it was supposed to be this declaration but a lot of people just want to look at like the the horrible massacres which is man if i look through my history classes that's all they fucking taught well, well, it's complicated, and 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 and, and again, back to your point about we we, we are here. In, you tell me, and talk to about my students. We are here, and they're there, and, and 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 of course, everybody rightly so thinks about what we call today race. But it, it seems to me that that this kind of behavior I'm talking about with these pirates and pitching up and the shopping lists and so forth. It doesn't even rise to that level. There's no, there's no indication thinking, oh, we are superior to these people. We have the right to do this. We're just going to turn up and, and engage in it. So in, in, a, in a sense, it's worse than thinking about this and, think, oh, the human being, like the, like the analogy with the person in the kitchen, it's like saying there's nobody in the kitchen and, or that there's some other entity in the kitchen I can do what I, what I want because they're yeah. just another commodity. The power structure through history is probably one of the weirdest ones because I feel like a lot of information – if you look at like Egypt, for instance, I was always fascinated with there was the, the, the pharaoh or the king, and the king had a high priest, which was seen as like his right hand or his left hand because that was a direct – connection to god and if the king was the son of god somehow the powers amongst the years got transferred to where the priest was holding the powers he was able to make the calls the people actually feared him more this the power structure thing is insane to me i mean i like more about the aspects of like looking at norse mythology or through anything through the crusades when you're really examining clear evident kingship or king, clear evident this when you look at the basic functions of like this idea that's still lingering on today it's been lingering on through history is the fact is who is is there someone that's more superior than others all oh, the right's more superior than the left the left's more superior than the right all oh, the blue the red the democrat the republican you sort of look at like aren't we all just people like there's no difference between us what we're doing now but the differences but back then maybe someone had another advantage but the fighting is still the same and the comparability of a person's character is judged on the fact that you're not willing to understand their reality. Their reality might be the earth is flat. That doesn't mean you're smarter than that person because you, you know it's not. It just means that person has received information that you have not received. Their reality is now a different reality. Our conversation, me and you create right now, is now a whole new reality that anybody listening to is now stepping into this reality that now we are fabricating and we can choose to take in whichever direction. I was like, if more people just look at it like that, it's so fucking easy to listen to someone and just talk to someone and see how they think. But everyone's like, no, your thoughts are invaders into my thoughts. And it's like, well, that's actually not true. If we're all genetic code for all processing information, we all have something to learn off somebody else. If you're well, and also, but also on the on kind of the flip side, people, all, all people can be ambitious and greedy <laughs> And, yeah, and, and, deceitful and little bastards, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that also gets, I mean, that also gets lost in some of the the heat that gets generated in in these arguments because humanity is humanity, and oftentimes people come up short in terms of the so called moral code, whoever whoever's devising it. I've started uh, to realize that I think more people, at least through like if I examine like a conversation on Twitter between two people or two sides. 
everyone looks at themselves as the defender and then everyone looks at the other person as the attacker and it's start to realize like you both it's kind of like cobra kai that show that was based on karate kid you if you okay. watch that show you, these guys that have this long confrontation there's just bits and pieces that are before their interactions that lead up to them hating each other where it's like you guys are both like you're misunderstood and it was like a bigger scale view of like a lot of history is misunderstood i mean empire of the summer moon i don't know if you've ever read that book but it's a lot about the indigenous people like the comanches and oh, yeah people talk about like the study in digital studies that book is racist i'm like well it's recommended by jordan peterson and like ten thousand other people that are highly named people that say it's actually a very interesting and great book but you start to look at it it's like when you're involved in indigenous studies and you're talking about anything early american they get defensive because all they've seen is the slaughter rather Mm -hmm. than seeing the other perspective of like taking a journey and not understanding and then coming across people that are eating livers out of animals. That's scary sight for people that didn't believe that type of thing. It's the perspectives. It's so hard to fuse the two because when you get dive into one, then the other one has to be wrong. And I'm like, that's not what it is. I think everybody's receiving the same journey, but the journeys are ending differently based on everyone's own reality that they're constructing. Yeah, and and it's hard, especially for when when considering well, so called Indians, because that's a generic term also for Europeans. For this, this course, I was just telling you about the age of discovery. It went to Polynesia and Indians, but but for 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 but for non Europeans, especially in America, the Americas, and in the Pacific, the the first first off it's because of the demographic collapse of many of these societies we've lost a lot of evidence and besides that and i'm also teaching a course on so-called indians of new york state at the, at the at, as i'm speaking to you right now too and 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 absolutely people are want to be sympathetic to to horrors that that vicious populations incurred but but especially in new york state those horrors didn't really get going until after American independence and it happens quite quite quickly but in that period from about 1780 1775 1780 to 1840 the whole their whole world is ripped out and that 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 almost revolution if, you, if that's the word the, the the dramatic change in a short period of time that's had of course had a substantial impact on subsequent understandings of this and then you look back at, and the, the view is Oh, this is horrible. But in, in the 17th century and in the 18th century, even up to the, even up to the War of Independence, especially the Iroquois, and it's part of their drill, we can, un, we can understand that they're in a position to manipulate, control, to a very large degree, economic and political activity, especially with other Native groups who hate them, and with the Europeans. And they, enter, they, enter, they enter into agreements, they go to war, and they are, to a very large degree, able to, again, sort of convey the impression, which was their ultimate goal, that they are in, they are in charge of things. And the you know, Europeans complained about this and tried to manifest their superiority in various ways. The reality was, even in, say, 1760, there aren't very many uh, colonies or towns of European background in the interior of North America. Albany, Springfield, and dinky places. Uh, they're not very far in land. And if, oftentimes, if uh, Europeans wanted to build forts, for instance, first of all, they couldn't do it without Iroquois permission. Or the Iroquois sometimes invited them to do that because they wanted to be able to control the Europeans. It's easier. You know what? We were talking about this the other day in class. And, and the, the, the Iroquois, the Mohawks told the Dutch to build a, a fort in Schenectady. I don't know if you know the geography of New York State at all. But it's about geography. About twenty. If if you know Albany is between Buffalo and Boston, well, Schenectady is about twenty miles west, and Mm -hmm. and Albany is not in the so-called traditional Mohawk territory. And the Mohawks got tired of stuffing the to Albany to do to conduct trade, and they told the Dutch, "You move to Schenectady, and make it easier for us." It used to be thought or argued that "Eh, this is an example of European imperialism, where the, the Dutch built this fort and are encroaching on Iroquois territory. The reality is it's easier for us. We don't want to go to, to use in the contemporary terms. We don't want to go, we don't want to go to the mall. We want the mall to come to us when we do our fur trading. Yeah. We want to we want to be able to use you when we are fighting wars. We want to control access to you. 
And so you, this movement, this construction of this town, kind of counterintuitively, is an example actually of, I don't want to use the term empire, but of the Iroquois calling these shots. This is 1661. Even Detroit, even though the English, even though the French in the end built this fort without permission, in the end it was accepted because the French made the case that, we, that we're, we're going out all this way out west and it makes it easier for you all to trade and you can, you know, if, the end, if the end we don't get on, then we're cut off. Yeah. And that's that. Isn't this just an issue of just power of control? I mean, the same thing is happening today, just in a different form. I mean, there's people getting things that they want done all because of, and there's just a giant capture or expansion of land. Maybe it's in the name of democracy. Sure. Yeah. But it's just a different form, man. Like it's not about people. It's, it's people that just want power and look down at other people that aren't of their tribe. And that's not, I don't know if that, I don't think that's a race thing. I think that's just an aspect of just people. Just, if you're not in the group, you're not in the group you know what i mean yeah. like it's kind of like with abraham lincoln for instance people say he freed the slaves i was like well no he pardoned <laughs> he pardoned the ones that fought in the war with him and that i mean he kept them he had slaves that worked on his farm he just treated them differently you start to look at the examination as if you're part of my team then you're a part with me and that's how it, that's how it goes i mean there's plenty of old cowboy movies magnificent seven one of the seven guys one of the seven cowboys that saved this town was one of the indian tribe that joined in to help these people out there weren't enemies at that point they were friends even though the one dude who was on that team had his whole family slaughtered and scalped by indians or Native American people, you start to realize it's all about the teams, the tribes. If you're part of my group, then you're a part with me. If you're not, then you're now an enemy. And that's how everything has kind of always been. It's happening now. It's mm -hmm. always happened. I don't, I think the most important part about studying studying older history or early history or ancient history is the concept that we're not that different from that. People say you can look yeah. at the past and predict the future. Well, you can also find the, that little rope or whatever the hell it is that we're all supposed to be hanging on to right now, because right now everyone feels like we're in a time that's never, ever happened before. In some ways, yeah. that's a hundred percent true, but our basic primal actions are kind of the same. Yeah. And, I mean, the, another example, and I don't, I don't want to be sanguine about the horrors of smallpox and so forth, because there's no question that we're talking about you know, somewhere between 40 and 90% of the population of the Americas was wiped out by diseases, then you got to give those plague doctors credit on those masks. Holy <laughs> right. shit. That's some scary stuff. And, and, and but, for, but, but even at, at Custer's so-called last stand, he had crow scouts with him who took him to crazy horses encampment. They saw what was what and they said, are you going to attack them? Hey, well, have a nice day. We'll see you at the backside. <laughs> that mean the, I mean, the crows themselves are a nation that came into existence because it's a reconfiguration of earlier nation tribes into a larger nation to deal with the calamities with smallpox. But as you say, the Lakota, we have hated them since time immemorial and we would rather help the Americans. This is 1876, for crying out loud, when it's, I mean, almost at the depth of the native situation in, in this country and in Canada and so forth, we're still going to help the Americans against our ancient enemies. Yeah. Weren't, yeah. What about what, what's with the Comanches? I always hear people mention them as like one of the deadly or one of the most powerful kind of tribes that really, because they slaughtered <laughs> their own people as well too, not Comanches, but other tribes. Yeah. Well, the Iroquois are kind of the same. Where, where, I mean, the, the, to a certain extent, they benefited from geography because they're not on the coast. So the, the shocks are sometimes called of contact with Europeans, especially disease, were less apparent. And they also had advantages in terms of commercial routes. And, and they fought wars to adopt people into their nations as well. Uh, and so by, even by the end of the 17th century, when they kind of had a time out, there were more adoptees in the Iroquois Confederacy than might say native born Iroquois. It's, it's a it's a the demographic shift that, that in the end all these all these people had to deal with, all these cultures, because of the effects of disease. You want to you want to keep up your numbers, you want to keep up your culture, you're going to have to bring in others in some kind of way, shape, or form, or vice versa, in order to ma maintain yourselves. The, Iro the Iroquois happened to be particularly successful and they fought wars like the Comanches to, to do that and to, and for trade. Now, the other thing about this that I wanted to mention is 
there's no getting around the reality that the, a number of these societies practiced how to characterize it. Well, they, ritual torture, and this could have, couldn't did include the consumption of blood and captive body parts. It's a ritual kind of deal, and of course, this, this completely shocked and me cannibalism. Yeah, yeah, well, it's 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 what it's worth. Highly ritualistic. And, on, and not done by everybody. It's, 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 again, these are highly ordered societies in certain respects. Only, only I say, authorized individuals could engage in the consumption of human flesh and or blood. Well, the cannibalism, there's, a, there's many societies and other cultures that had cannibalism. It wasn't just Native American people. No, it's not the same as Aztecs, Mayans, but there's also, yeah. there were some settlers that actually there was a disease. I forgot the name of the disease is called, but you can only get it from eating brain tissue or spinal tissue or some type of yeah. t- type of thing out of that certain part of a human. It's They named it something. I forgot the name of it, but it's the same thing as like mad cow disease. Like they were feeding cows yeah. cow, and then you figure out the cows are getting this disease from eating themselves basically. And that's what we eventually figured out what this disease was. You can get it multiple other ways too. I think there's only very few rare niche things things where it's like i think you have to eat feces or something like that but it's yeah. this degenerative brain disease that you get from eating human brain tissue or some type of spinal thing someone had to figure that out by eating or being a cannibal so it's not like it's it's seen in different <laughs> practices i mean actually i listened to an evolutionary biologist who was talking about um our bodies like uh he had lost a bunch of teeth his name's eric weinstein i don't know if you know who he is or no brett weinstein i don't know if you know who he is Um, But he was talking about how he lost a couple of teeth and it was all because um, they said that his ortho orthodontia had moved his teeth too quickly and had actually moved his mouth and pushed them into a different spot. A lot of the issues like people losing teeth and there were people that lost teeth back in the day for sure too, but our bodies have changed. And I think that's an evolution or at hand to think that our science is capable of doing so and expanding it out. There's people that will get full healthy parts of their intestine taken out all because they don't need it. There's doctors like you don't need this part of your healthy intestine. Does that sound right? That doesn't sound right in an evolutionary standpoint at all. You might not need your appendix, but necessarily i don't want to have to get a surgery i don't have to get you know what i mean yeah um yeah i i, I mean again this is a highly ritualistic and, and oftentimes particularly sacred ceremonies whites were barred from I mean, we, were, we were doing our thing and your presence is basically a sacrilege so you're out so we don't really have details about what was transpiring unless i mean and the, oftentimes the observers are secondhand and of course they're appalled because they're like priests who were wonderful captives for this kind of thing, because the idea was we want prisoners on the torture platform to express no, no, uh, no kind of uh, emotion, no fear, no crying out. Just and for the priests when they're captured, would say, "Oh, I'm suffering martyrdom in the wilderness for our faith." This is these are the proverbial hellhounds who are who are out to get me, the spawn of Satan, quote unquote. So you just sort of zone out. Yeah, and say the rosary and pray and that, that, that and and the Iroquois love this because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're you're really bearing up well under the torture. So in the kind of sense I, I tell my students, this is kind of everybody's happy in this kind of bizarre cultural relativistic kind of way. The Iroquois have great captives and the, and the priests are suffering martyrdom. And several of them were canonized in the 1930s. So have you ever heard of a uh, general butt naked? No. So he was an African warlord, and there's a documentary on Netflix you can watch called The Redemption of Butt Naked. Basically, okay. it was this guy who used to go into war literally butt naked besides wearing sandals. But he would, like, eat people. You'd eat babies because they believed you would harness their power if you ate it. But he thought no it's bullets could hit him idea, if he wasn't yeah. wearing any clothes. But he literally thought that he was, like, I, th- I think it was the, the devil or something like that. He thought yeah. – and it's weird because they ended up – like, he ended up turning to God and finding, like, Jesus Christ and then becoming this thing that actually donates money to uh, disband um, kid – child troops in africa he builds all these foundations to help these kids in the situation to make sure what he experienced was wrong he doesn't want anybody to experience that ever again but they were in a market filming this documentary and he's like sitting down he goes and there was this meat and when i ate it i knew it was human flesh because i had tasted human flesh and you're like holy fucking shit like <laughs> that's some nut stuff man imagine <laughs> eating something and knowing that it was this thing that you used to eat that you know that these people are now making yeah, that's uh, it can be tough to get your mind around. <laughs> it's just history. It's like Jesus, right, yeah, well, there's, yes. there's so much. 
I mean, uh, and again, and, and, and students who aren't necessarily familiar with this, and, and, and it's also kind of, there's also a kind of a, a, a pair of sort of tropes, if that's the word, where you have the, it goes back even to the beginnings of so-called first contact. You have good Indians and bad Indians. And the cannibals, of course, are... <laughs> It's hard to get past the eating people thing when, you, when right. I, I, I get it. If I see somebody eating somebody in the street, I'm like, that's bath salts. Don't do that. Right. Remember that trend that was happening? People are eating oh, other yeah, people's right. faces. <laughs> right. I'm good. So, so that, that's, that's just something that, that back to our earlier, dis, earlier discussion that you have to under, try to appreciate, understand people within their, and their cultures in this kind of, on their own terms. Because otherwise, you're never going to get any kind of understanding about what they're doing and what they were on about and what they thought and with how they behaved. That can be hard to do because it means shifting your, your own perspective and trying to get into their heads in their culture. I mean, there's no way getting around it. We, we, are, we are we and they are they. And like even history, we're used to studying and understanding history in a linear kind of way. Many cultures understand it in a circular kind of way. We were talking about this in class last night, which is why it's fresh in my mind. And, and the, the students are there, oh, many of them are going to be teachers themselves. And, and then they said, oh, like we're talking about the conquest of Mexico. And yes, it's, it's, again, it's a tragedy. Horrible stuff happened. And, but if, if, if and, it's, and it's entirely counterintuitive, the, the, the important thing from the native perspective possibly is that it survived it did not it was not annihilated wiped out totally and so if you look at it from a native perspective according to the accounts that we have Makazuma, for instance saw all these omens and and these had these dreams of devastation and sort of lost and what's, what's the point this is going to happen our the gods have decreed that we're in for it and you know, that's it and 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 this would then explain his supposed inaction when the Spaniards came and that, 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 that. and then smallpox and destruction and the, and, and, the, and the annihilation of the capital city and the rival Spaniards and that, 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 that. But out of that, in kind of a circular kind of way, then you have, again, looking at it as much as we can from a native perspective, since we're not them, you have, you have a situation where the natives having survived all this, incorporate from their perspective Spanish beliefs, Spanish perspectives, European perspectives into their culture and in surviving, try to strengthen that culture again. It, from their perspective, they are still in charge. The wheel is turning. Now, whether you buy that or not is another question, but that, that's an argument that can be made, like, like the idea with forts. We can... It's definitely an interesting concept. I think... Um... <laughs> what I really appreciate about anything is the fact that like when you can truly, I guess the, the perspective, I guess, I mean, I guess that's what the show is really is just about a perspective of things because I mean, is it better to live on in story and be constantly told about rather than this idea like immortality, for instance, every person is searching for immortality, whether it's digital immortality or whether it's some concept, but how many people are in legends or in tales that get told even today, a thousand years later, you know what I mean? It's a concept of being immortalized. You're never going to forget native Americans. Nobody's ever going to forget slavery. It's immortalized, but people are trying to tear up the past and delete it. And it's like, but that just does the whole service of discredit. If we don't educate and learn and see the perspectives from both hands, both sides, winner and loser, history is written by the winner. But who's to say that that winner just refuses to lose? You know what I mean? That's what. No. Yeah. And, and I mean, his history is not set in stone. I mean, as, as you know, and you have been hinted at it here, I mean, it's all kicked off about in, in every kinds of way, shapes and forms in Europe. In, and in, in, in this country and Canada, Australia, all over the place about, about who owns history. Well, no one does because people did what they did and moved on, so to speak. It's, it's how what history is, is, is making sense, how people make sense of this and how they adapt it to, in, to their own understanding. And the people who 
as with all human beings, the people who you who do these things for how to say it for less less intellectual reasons and for their own purposes in a material or uh, political sense, and there are those who do things for other reasons that that are hopefully uh, how to characterize this intellectually clean rather than just for, for the purpose of understanding knowledge and advancing it and trying to get at as you were saying what are these what are these cultures about why do they do things as best, as best as we can given the realities of things like the character of the record and all this death um do, that's that's that's, that's, do, you that's do, do you receive more positive than negative comments when you're teaching something like this because i gotta think that after a while this gets to be like a heavy topic for a lot of people yeah it's, it's i mean especially i mean even the other day we were talking about these these were a lot of my first year students who were still getting getting their feet wet we've only been in the term for six weeks and we started talking in, in some detail about, about <laughs> paint and blood on yeah. the walls and shit. Yeah, right, yeah, right, <laughs> exactly, right. So, so I mean, they're, they're just just out of just out of the home and everything. We talk about the slave trade, and and I said that we're, we're, we're talking here that we and we talk about the idea of even of numbers. Is this this is is the volume of people who are who are trafficked? The numbers are off the charts. Does, 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 is it even worth is it adding to understanding to, um, to have some kind of number about, about these people? Because the numbers aren't even, aren't even, they're all over the place. You, the minimum, I mean, it goes higher, even as we're speaking. The numbers, the estimates increase. So right now, it, it's about 12 and a half million people. It's a database where we have about two thirds, they have about two thirds of the voyages that were made from Africa to the Americas from 1490 or so, 1500 to the 1880s. That number, is, it doesn't include people who never made it on board a ship. That, people, that, that, that number does not include people who didn't, even, didn't make it to a European port or a European owned factory in a control factory in Africa. It doesn't include, of course, about a third of the voyages, all this number is decreasing. It doesn't include people who died on board ship necessarily. So the numbers could be 20 million. I was going to say numbers, numbers seem excessive when we talk about something like amount of like slavery or amount of trafficking that happens. Cause I think all, any of it, even if it's one or two is horrible. But exactly. You, you hit that, me with 12 is, that's, million that's, and I was like, right. fuck, <laughs> that's right. a so big we, impact. I, said, I mean, we, we want to get, we want to have some kind of idea of the scale, but that doesn't really, the numbers are so vast as to, as to say, well, does it really lend any, shed any light on the character of, of this whole practice, except to say that it's essential to our understanding of various other historical phenomena. Yeah. And you know, what do we do about that? Well, I got a big question for you. Did, did pirates exist? Of course they did. Okay, because every time I'm trying to get someone to talk specifically pirates on my show, or like study a PhD in piracy, it's Ooh, just I know, fucking. Several, I know several PhDs in piracy. Let's go! I, every it's time all, I look for it, all I see is DVD rentals. I'm like, I don't want to pirate a no, DVD. No, I, no want to, I want to. Yeah. I want to know Blackbeard. In, in, in fact, our journal. I want. To, I want to have a special issue on piracy. Oh, they absolutely, absolutely. I mean, these guys I was just telling you about that were hanging out on the coast of Africa. They're pirates. <laughs> I meant like they're the, not, the, 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 the the cutlass people with the the that, black flag. Well, that and... kind of thing too. I mean, that kind of thing. I mean, yes, the image is, is again kind of a nineteenth century image, but their characters running around the Caribbean from the get. The, you can even say, though, speaking of the the about revision of history and contesting history, that the 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 incident that brought the the first Africans mentioned at Jamestown in sixteen nineteen were brought there by pirates. Those, those people were on board a Portuguese uh, slaver traveling from Angola to Cartagena again. This Anglo-Dutch crew bushwhacked them, bushwhacked the ship, and among other things, took, took these people to Jamestown. Now, so every, all the time. Every depiction that happens of like Pirates of the Caribbean or something like that. Now, are <laughs> these, these pirates, like these these ones that get told about like Blackbeard or whoever, 
do these types of pirates, those basic character ones, not the ones that you can see in like Somalia now, but just the pirates that from this time, are these people that were against the military and just trying to be vigilantes? Like, were they trying to be liberators or was it a concept of being able to do the things that they wanted to do without anybody telling them what to do? Like how we have like anarchy in a way. Well, there are people who, who argue both. And to my mind, I mean, it's easy to romanticize pirates. You know, you're a kid, you read Treasure Island, and you, well, if you're an old kid now, if you're old now, you're a kid, you read Treasure Island, and you've seen movies and so forth. But it's, it was a hard life. I mean, you really have to use your wits. Uh, there, it's no holds barred. It's anarchy and it's survival of the fittest. And, and these people didn't live very long as a rule. Either they're, well, either they're killed by their, their counterparts either on their own crew or somebody else, or they're killed by some ship in some ship attack that there's, re there's resistance, or like, like, like uh, Blackbeard, he's hunted down and uh, done away with by the authorities, although the colonial authorities weren't too keen on it, but they were told to do that. I thought he was it's, still alive. Imagine that. Fucking... Yeah, sorry, there's ghosts around, apparently. <laughs> Sipping a pina colada on an island right. somewhere. But the smuggling but... islands, for instance, like those islands were just, they weren't people that were looking to kill people. They were just people looking to trade without having to pay this yeah. unreasonable tax that the military yeah. thought they could do. I mean, there's people that pirate movies on the concept of they don't want to pay the fee or do all these types of things because they've seen it as un... it's not fair to charge that. They want this to be free to use, even though it is yeah. a money-making thing. But with um yeah the amount of like people getting killed by their counterparts pirate wise i mean we saw during the pandemic the domestic uh, abuse rate went up yeah. imagine being on a fucking ship for seven months with some dude who's drunk and he challenges you to a fight and then he keeps going after you're not you know after you're knocked out and you just decide to pull out a sword and stab the guy yeah well i mean there are bases and and, and places around the for instance the caribbean was good for this because there are all these tiny islands that you can hang out on pirate havens uh and and places like what is today haiti were founded to a degree by the word buccaneer is a french french derivative for the, to, to who basically talk about people who roast pigs on these islands that outside of the outside of the uh purview of, of authorities and people came all over from, did this all over the place in the caribbean there, there are places like venezuela where basically they're supplied by interlopers now whether you call them pirates in the classic Johnny Depp sense or not, a Keith Richards sense. Jack Sparrow. Right, they're right. But they're people, they are people who are operating outside of the law. And they pop up in Santo Domingo. They, op they pop up in Venezuela. They pop up in Jamaica. They pop up in on Española. I mean, Haiti, I should say. And it, this is a part of the course. And, and, and in some cases, they were welcomed, like on Jamaica. And there were big fights with people who didn't like having pirates around because you know, it's an anarchical element and give, gives uh, people the wrong idea about what we're doing here. Not to mention the government takes a view. So there's, a, there's, a, there's these other kinds of <laughs> other frictions going on too. The connection that technology has done for us has connected our worlds in so many ways. Where I mean worlds, not as in planets, but as in in every area through history, you see around the same time period these large different scale kind of models in a way are happening. You know, in the Caribbean, you might have pirates, but in a place not even across the globe, you're seeing a whole different endeavor of ideas or creative methods. I mean, when I look through, like talk to someone who studies architecture or when I look through old landscape photos, the buildings are so different, but it's around the same time period where I'm like, everyone's in literally their own world. And this world is like, you don't understand is that not even that far over, there's another world where they think everything is there that's why i talk about realities our minds are like that we think everything in our mind is true or these types of things and then you enter someone else's and now there's this whole other reality another perspective you're starting to see that's the same thing with back then fucking mm -hmm. you're robbing ships and doing all this and over there they're fighting whatever c colonials or something like that. i don't know it's just something that's different history same planet that's what's mm -hmm. nuts and, and and for various reasons, people want to appropriate what they regard as the cultures of others, and and use it for their own. Yeah, Get me my eye patch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you see, you go to Britain, you see all all these buildings like in Glasgow that are, that are done up in a kind of 
Indian, that is a, a subcontinental kind of style where it got to be kind of a fashion. You could really do this in the 19th century when these things really got intense, where you could borrow fashion, you could borrow, you could incorporate uh, what, you, what you regarded as fashion or it struck you as aesthetically pleasing, as well as a reflection perhaps of an imperial power over a distant place yeah. and incorporate that into your sensibilities. Well, the biggest and, example of that would be dreads. People talk about dreads. You stole yeah, that yeah. from from like cool. African people. It's like, well, no, dreads were a sign of dirty hair. I actually have a buddy who studies Spartan history, and he goes, Spartans in the arena would knot their hair together in dreads because it was just dirty and clumped up and kept it out of their face while they're fighting. Well, also in, in Rastafarian practice, you don't cut your hair, and it's a way to pin it up. It. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I said. All these cultures, I think, isn't it all just all one culture? I know there's different <laughs> multiple little cultures, but like, I hate to be the guy that's like, aren't we all the same? It's like, but that is true. We're all technically one species just yeah. running with different variants or different subsidies or whatever. That's the weird part that I don't like about today is that everything's got to be in a category or labeled. Everybody wants to be unique. And I'm like, you guys connect more on your differences than you do your similarities. The similarities help in a way. Me and you talking about a certain thing or enjoying a certain part, but our differences are supposed to be expanded upon to learn more and to have a discourse where we yeah. receive different information that – necessarily we might not have gotten without it and a lot of this is the fault of the enlightenment uh like linnaeus classifying everything that's where it got to be, got to be formalized where you have a pyramid with every so-called race allocated of course the whites are on top because the whites are doing this um among other reasons and and then you have this again descending order of things and as with plants and animals linnaeus classified them and then you have this handy system of categorization that that in the end emphasizes what appear to be physical differences and then these qualities can't be adjusted you're stuck quote unquote this is where full-blown racism comes into play after about 1740 as, as we think of it today or as it's, as it's known today the idea of race and racism it's hard to yeah that's one of those things that just it's a triggering thing for a lot of people to hear when mm. as soon as anything when it comes to racism or slavery people just want to peg or categorize somebody as something and i think it's it's what's really weird about the word today like being called a racist doesn't have the impact it did maybe a year or two ago because it gets labeled on everything i mean coca-cola put out an article for their company saying how to be less white <laughs> to me that sounds pretty fucking racist but to a lot of people, they don't care. Well, and of course, it's something we talk about in class, and 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 and, uh, and then a lot of the things that are, are situations and behavior. Good on that, you for talking down that bomb, because I don't want to be in a class with a bunch of first year students. Do, like, <laughs> your picture and just start yeah, screaming what are you at you. Do? Uh, students are students are, are following this stuff; they're aware of it, and and this is what the university is for, to my mind, to talk about these things. But what do I know? Anyway, anyways. Back to your point, I, I, I tend to agree that that it's it's easy to how to characterize it, mix what 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 people call about as race with culture and ethnicity. So, in my own mind, a racist is someone who not only believes in these distinctions that we've been talking about, but believes that in the end you're stuck because of whatever qualities you have. That is, your your physical characteristics determine yours your your abilities and, and 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 to my mind this is of course rubbish yeah but 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 racism is not the same thing as prejudice where you see somebody and you say oh you're going to be because first of all prejudice can be changed and and well the racist will never be never have their mind changed because they they it's hardwired into them for every reason they've hardwired into their own minds that this is how things are but but a prejudice comes from kind of as we were talking about oh you see somebody on the torture platform being as the phrase, as the documents say, barbecued, uh, and you you have an affinity with this, with with that person, either culturally or eth ethnic, in ethnic terms, then it's easy to say, oh, we are civilized and you are savage. That's not necessarily a racist argument. I mean, this may be overly academic and overly fine an argument, but again, if you're if you're basing your analysis on misapprehensions of culture and ethnicity. 
that's different than race, which again is a, whatever we may think, the people who devised this so-called thinking were thinking in terms of, of physical characteristics. And I don't think, as you, as you were saying, I don't, I don't think that yeah, skin color is still a big than obvious way to distinguish people. And therefore is it the prime element of race. But I, I, don't, I don't know that there are that many scientific racists out there today as there were even say, I'm old enough to remember this stuff. I'm old, I'm old enough that when I was a child, you could buy a book and you would see the pyramid I'm talking about, put, put in the book as you know, truth of the way things are. So I, I don't think we see books like that around today. Yeah, at, least, least, at least not in the going to a regular store on the internet and buying it. Yeah, mm. there's, there's a, I think there's only like a total of like 10 or nine members left in the KKK and that they, they, they're, they're all jokes. Like they're not, I don't think they're seriously into whatever that, that used to be. I mean, it was a big issue for sure. Nobody's glossing over that, but it's just, it, there's a point where I think you start to understand is like the divisiveness the divisiveness and the siding that happens is just translated to pol political stuff now it's always going to translate to something different because people want to feel like they're part of a certain group and going against another group that's why the crips and bloods are still happening they're fighting over something they don't even remember why they're fighting over but they're doing it new members are getting every single day because that's just what it is it's about being in people a family someone that cares and agrees with everything that you agree with and always has your back and that's mm -hmm. kind of like what people and i'm like i had a buddy of mine say this to me um he's he's filipino but he asked me he goes now being white like you think that is like is that do you use that like i was like what do you mean he goes do you use that as like define who you are like does my race define who i am no my content of my character defines who i am the person i am defines who i am same thing the person who you are defines you who you are to me you know you tell me who you are you and i talk with you and we understand each other and i think it was that kind of question where it was like yeah how many people use it and i'm not against people using their race to get an advantage for sure sure if you want to say well i'm native american and they accept you to a school go ahead use it i don't care but i don't think to me that doesn't define if i'm going to like you or not what defines if i'm going to like you is if i can have a genuine conversation and you don't treat me like i'm lower than you i raise i want everyone to be on the same level i mean i know that's an impossible goal but at the same time these divisiveness in this fighting and siding in this you know there's writing communities podcasting communities there's uh history communities there's medieval twitter there's all these niche groups <laughs> and if you don't study certain things you're not involved in these niche groups and i'm like i get it because it's about protecting and making a safe spot but shouldn't we just look at it as like maybe there's people out there that want to expand their thought and understand more as well too it's why i give you um major credit and major like thank yous um just because you did my show and you're able to because i mean you don't know what you're getting into you see a 20 year old kid talking to people on a podcast you could either be killed or you could be yelled at for something that you study you know? for the torture platform yeah i just i'm <laughs> curious into this stuff because nobody ever wants to talk about this in a way that can be civilly discussed or an understanding or a learning process. Most yeah. of it comes down to, well, then you're just ignorant. And then it just gets to this point where people want to chop off your thought and dismiss it because it doesn't fit with their own. And I'm like, well, the whole point is that we're supposed to not have guards up. We're supposed to talk and just have that beer conversation. I mean, is that, I think that's authenticity or that's just some point of caring and understanding that I think the world is lacking in a major sort of, sort of way, but I don't know. I mean, people used to fight and then drink a beer afterwards. I don't really see that all happening now. People fight now and then they'll try and ban you off something. Right. You know, you know, social platforms anymore, either usually <laughs> they're captured. By the other side. Yeah. But, but, but um, I, I think, I think, Part of, part of part of the issue for people who like this, like this monuments business is that people have been accustomed going back even to the 17th century to doing things in a certain way, and this is how things have carried on. And we have kind of slotted in behavior and so forth, and and devised constantly otherwise scenarios that we expect to be perpetuated. And and their their problem is because it's their problem is that having most particularly hauled millions of people from Africa to America against their will, well, the problem then comes to be, shock the human beings, they don't like the situation, 
they will take steps to try to rectify it. What happens next? And that process that has been going on pretty much from the get-go also, but has, inc has increased in intensity, I think, only at least in, in publicity, because more people are aware of it in, in say, over the last 50 years or so. That, in the end, has presented an increasingly intensive challenge to this kind of, oh, this is all nice, and, and this is the way things should be. And in essence, white people are on top, and black people are beneath this line that we've drawn. Um, I'm a, I, how, do I, how do I deal with this? Or, or worse, you're not keen on dealing with it, and you just want to maintain what had been maintained. That, that's, that's, that's what has to be addressed, I think. Yeah, I think the idea that we have preconceived notions on another person is just you can't have preconceived notions of people. You have to take people how they come. You have to understand that what you've heard is not the interpretation you're going to have with this person. People hear things and they think that's how it is. And I think I, I don't know, maybe it gets to a point where people just people just want to change other people. People just want to do all this type of stuff. I'm like, dude, fuck it. I'm going to drink a soda. And I'm going to let you be you and you, I'm not going to change you because people don't want to change or people or people hate that they have to be changed. I'm like, nobody has to be changed. Just be you, man. People are going to society is literally going to phase you out if you don't evolve with it. That's just what's going to happen. And sadly, or not sadly, but it, uh, society is evolving. And sadly, these people that are upset with everything that's going on and all these issues that come on when it comes to social things, I get it. Society is evolving in such a way where there's comedy jokes that I used to think that were funny that I don't think are funny anymore because mm. society has changed in a different way. Society has changed on legalization of like gay marriage or anything of these or different genders that wasn't thought talked about 10 years ago. That wasn't talked about 15 years ago. That's been throughout history. Very rare cases, but now it's becoming more normal where I'm like, see how society is evolving. Just understand that the people that don't evolve or refuse to evolve end up getting phased out. So you don't have to try and invest time in changing someone. Just understand them. Explain yourself. Talk. Have this civil discourse and you fucking learn something along the way. It's not hard. Well, it would seem not, but <laughs> never, yeah. never society left. says otherwise. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> If people are fearful for whatever reason, they're vested in whatever they're doing. They don't. They don't want to sh to share it or to give up power or whatever it is. And and I'm not arguing with you in the slightest. But 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 many of these people are accustomed, or or because of because of the practice of slavery, they're accustomed to thinking of people of African descent as inferior, and that just has carried on. And that 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 is something that's. And I mean, this is the big sort of legacy of enslavement that is practiced in places like the United States. People don't want people don't want to give that up, even if even if slavery is is done away with. Uh, there's, there's still this for some reason failure to recognize people, whether they're of African or other other non-European descent, and sometimes even a certain European descents as people that in the end. Hmm. You don't come with them with any prejudices. Uh, you try to understand where they're coming from, and, and vice versa. Yeah. And maybe it comes the meaning of the minds. I, I don't, I don't get it either. But what can I, I tell you? Say, maybe it's just the area that I'm in. But I haven't come across a lot of people that still believe that type of thing. I think there's hit a new type of idea now. Like I've been talking about, is more about if you're mask or anti-mask. Like there's just this whole entire vax and anti-vax type battle that's going on. There's not really races involved in it anymore. I don't. I don't know if it's my circle, but I also I'm a minority in the place that I live. So I don't <laughs> see a whole lot of like, I mean, I, I, racism mm -hmm. is just hating person on the color of their skin, not really right. their content of their character. I think it's more about just a confliction of different types of lifestyles that have happened. And I think that's what makes uh, people say can say America is the most racist country. But I'm like, well, we're the one that's the most diverse. Like if you mm -hmm. look in Canada or other European places that complain about all oh, racism it's like well you don't have really anything but white people there and you start to realize it's just a it, it's so hard to even live with your family for a very yeah. long time without trying to kill somebody so <laughs> the fact that we're all managing in this country already or in any country that we're all living on this one planet together is pretty fucking fascinating despite all the people bring up what about the crime rate yeah 
But I mean, it could be worse. There could be purges every single day that could be happening, but it's not happening. And actually, surprisingly, when I go to the store, it's more like, hey, open up the door for someone. When you say some, hear someone say, thank you, you're like, yeah. fuck, I haven't heard that in a long time. It's like, yeah, because there's manners out there. There's just, I think yeah. there's just, it's something else is on everybody's mind. And I think that's just the whole politics stuff starting to phase its way in. It's it's get, It's a little bit getting very divisive, which I don't like, but. I don't know. I mean, we're still like what a couple thousand years old, apparently. So, well, right. There's still and there's still a lot of fear. I mean, yeah. that's never going to end, right? And and, and there's and there's this and it's and it's become increasingly important important in terms of understanding the history, like 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 the Haitian Revolution, the big the big slave revolt that resulted in the creation of Haiti. That is master's worst nightmare. And and white people, I think, still think about that to a degree. That that this is in the end. Back to your point about I violence. I didn't know about that. Oh, there you go. This is this is the knockdown, drag out, burn plantations, kill whites. And it's lo- that's a long time. There was a bit in being a full a war that dragged in other countries because they were they were keen to keep this at best on on the island or in the colony of, of Haiti, and not spread to say Jamaica. And it resulted in the creation of a republic that exists today. Although the French, in granting independence in the end of Haiti, received oh some ridiculous I've never amount, heard of amount this. of payments in gold. It just ended <laughs> in the 1950s. So I... people ask about why Haiti is, is the way it is, quote unquote. The answer is because they were paying through the nose in gold to France for from 1804. I want to say so. Blame the French. Why are you blaming white well, it's people? Always, it's always, you know, it's always a safe rule in history. But <laughs> oh <laughs> no, my but, but god! Nevertheless, <laughs> that aside, that that is a main reason why the Haitian Republic was under this kind of economic hardship right from the get-go. They had to make these reparation payments, and again, they were huge. And they're, they're on the web somewhere, but um, and this went on for 150 years. Well, it's just like that photo of that guy on the horse that was doing border control where they saw a photo of that guy whipping the Haitian guy. Did you see the real photo, though, that came out later where they actually they photoshopped the whip to hit the guy when the whip it wasn't even a whip. It was reins for the horse. The dude had the guy by the shirt. Then there's another photo later. The dude openly spoke about this. He's a dad with kids. He was giving the kid water, too, as well. The, no. the guy, the big guy in the picture, he had a little kid. He was giving the kid water, but everyone just saw the headline and they photoshopped the rain to look like it was mm-hmm. whipping the guy. And then there was a back photo shot where it showed the guy he was grabbing the back of the dude's shirt because he was getting yeah. near the dude's front of his horse. Yeah. And it's like you see the mixed communication. That's what spreads that there's this over consumption of hatred that happens. There's definitely people out there that have this consumption or have this preconceived thought that they're superior. But it's not the it's not the main public. It's there's it's if you would have mm-hmm. talked about that Haitian thing to anybody that I know, I'll ask anybody listening probably just found that out for the first time. But a whole oh. group of people out there, you could put a sur- survey on people like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" It's not on nobody and nobody's thinking about that. Nobody even I don't think a lot of people remember that unless you specifically study that. I think this idea that everyone is racist is nuts. I think it's just about your tribe. And sadly, your tribe is now your political sides. And if, and if the tribe, so to speak, has created a situation where they were, first of all, they've created another tribe. Basically, in order to serve that tribe. That's there are thinking. cyborgs out there. There's a whole race of cyborg people. Well, that is in the end, the next sort of second you use robots and so forth, right? To yeah. Are you AI or they're... not AI? That'll be the next racism card. And, and in the end, like there's a Star Trek years ago, next generation, when data was put on trial and so forth. Anyways, or whether he was a human being or not. <laughs> Anyways, so, so, but that's the kind of thing that, that, that there, there, there came to be a need for labor manual labor mostly agricultural labor in a colony and and this was a this was came to be a convenient ready way to do this and can make a lot of money and slave africans were expensive and the slave traders made a lot of money about about you could you could purchase a, an, a slave african in say 1685 for 20 pounds sterling that's real money 
that's that's the average salary of say a cleric in the, in the Church of England at the time, the whole for a whole year. Oh, guess guess there's another guest. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Um, and and and, they, and you, you would you would you would I mean you would sell them for twenty pounds. You would buy them for like three pounds. So depending on your age and gender and so forth, but as an average, so that's seventeen pounds a head per. Do you think that people would be want to do that today? I think if they could get away, they do it with today. If they could get away with it. I think they definitely would do it. People traffic kids, no matter what race they yeah, are. Sure. Yeah. Well, they tend to be of course poor. Oftentimes, now this gets to be more contentious. If I got lost in Jamaica, I could be a slave. I could be sold for a hundred less than a hundred. I probably worth five. Well, well, that's more contentious because sometimes families either can't feed children and or they need extra money even today, and they they, they end up in these rings. There was there was a case. I guess it's been a couple of years ago now where there were children in a boat off the coast of Africa. They came from, I don't know if I recall correctly. Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't Ghana or one of the larger countries, but these were children who had been purchased and were being shipped to another place. And, and they were, they either ran out of fuel or somehow came to public attention. But this is still going on. Yeah, I don't know if that's racism, though, because I had a no, guest that was um, my third episode. Her family sold her to be married, and she's from Guyana, yeah. where she was sold for, like, I think, li literally, no joke, like two goats and, like, a chicken or mm -hmm. something like that. She mm -hmm. talked about that was her first arranged marriage when she was, like, 14 years old. Yeah. That happens no matter who you are. I think that just goes on in these – whatever oh, yeah. you want to call third world countries that don't have the benefit or luxury of having whatever education or information or whatever society has standards wise. I don't like the roll of the dice type method that people yeah. talk about with countries. Cause yeah. I'm like Africa had gold and all that stuff. That's why like, it was so hard. They could trade easy, but we kind of took advantage of that and traded them all these things and said that they didn't have anything that was of worth. Well, their idea of worth was food. Our idea was worse with shiny gold things, and that's kind of how that ends up going. But that, that happens anywhere. That's a, that's a shitty deal at a car salesman place. You know, you go get a car, yeah, guy exactly. sells you a fucking yeah. lemon for ten grand, and it's not worth a, it's not uh, worth that much. Like these slave auctions, oh god! Like you remember the horse auctions? Try not to end it on slavery, but you keep bringing well, the slave thing up. Sorry, I mean it, it, it's so important. It sucks, and, and you can't forget. And I'm not arguing with you. Yeah, it's ridiculous. But but the 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 the, 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 the European the, the English who who had these big plans revolving around the slave trade worked out this plan to a send acquire gold in Africa and ship it to India. And in fact, these Dutch guys I was telling you about captured a couple of these ships too when they were hanging around on the coast of Africa. Then then they then they would use the gold. Their factors, their traders in India would use the gold to buy Indian fabrics that African merchants liked. And those fabrics would be, and other, and cowries and other commodities in India, we exchange for African commodities that would include enslaved Africans. They would be shipped to Barbados and elsewhere and sugar and so forth shipped to Europe and elsewhere too. I went to Hawaii and I got two tikis for $45, little small little guys. Yeah, I went to... Uh, from a little barter, little market thing, a little, nice little Asian lady came up and said, here's two tikis for $50. I said, 50. She said, 45. I said, 45. And this is when I was like 14 years old, bought them, went mm -hmm. to the pharmacy to get like a drink or something. There were two tikis, the same exact ones for five bucks a piece. She ripped me off by $35. Yeah. I mean, there are differences. I mean, the trade with natives is different because they did have fundamentally different value understandings of value and their economies were almost completely different from European ones. But Africans, even though there's no currency, they, they demanded and knew and expected commodities and they didn't, have to, they didn't have to buy what Europeans had to offer. Yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a shitty sales pitch. That's yeah. what it is. It's taking advantage <laughs> of someone that doesn't know any better. I was not, taken not advantage of. Was I mad at her? No. 
I said, actually, I was pretty pissed, but I get it. It's hustling. You're going to see tourists come into your town every single day. Who cares if one gets ripped off? You're making more money for yourself and your family. I can't be mad at that. It sucks. It happens, but it, it's a factor of people trying just to be able. It's a factor of not caring about other people. You care about yourself. And you care about the people that you care about, the people, your family members. If we had more connection, more empathy, we care for more than just our inner circle. We would care and expand that circle out to every single person, which is very rare and hard to find. That's why I mentioned the person that yeah. thanked me for opening up the door for them. That person, that little manners, that little caringness, it's just understanding the manners aspect of things. The core principle of that is empathy. And sadly, I think it's getting better with empathy, but it's also getting worse because it's starting to translate onto social media, which I don't think is a great way for empathy. Right. So we have to live in hope, if not expectation. That's good. <laughs> I'm going to uh, wrap it here, but okay. Lou, you've given me enough of your time, man. Where can people oh. find your links, your Twitter? Is it just your Twitter? Oh. You have anything else you want to promote? I have a Twitter. I, I still have a Facebook account somewhere, um, but I'll have to get you the, uh, get you the I'll, link, I'll link I guess, to the that. Details. I'd like to talk to you again, but let me get some stuff on like actual pirate yeah. stuff, dude. I didn't know you were. Oh, yeah. Well, like, I, um, I don't know. If they're, they're, all, they're all youngsters and they're, they're really, they're bright and they know all kinds of stuff about it. Yeah. So, um, if you on Twitter, I mean, I mean, I've, I've tagged some of them now and again. Um, but I want to talk to you. They, yeah, they, 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 they know the drill, and they, they do all kinds of wonderful, interesting stuff about pirates. I just want to hear a good story about like a pirate that doesn't sound they, like a Disney movie. You know, what they I mean? have those too. Okay, good. Better than better than than Disney. Better than I guess, Disney. Yeah, I don't know. Jack Sparrow is yeah, pretty good, now. man. <laughs> well, Lou, I'll link it all. Well, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I appreciate you doing the podcast. Thanks for listening. Okay, to this episode, great. Out of the blank.